<laughs> hey, good morning. Uh, yeah, those of you watching online, I want to say, hey, we're glad you're tuned in as well. My name is Brent Hall. I'm the lead pastor here at Edinburgh Church. Uh, I did want to give you all just a heads up. Uh, next week, we're kicking off a new series called Jesus Culture, and we're going to be studying the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. Um, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about how do we live as citizens of, of, of the kingdom? How do we live as citizens of heaven here in this broken world in light of all the challenges and struggles and things that we face? Uh, Jesus has a lot to say on that. He wants us to live like we're already in heaven, but while we're here uh, on earth uh, where things aren't yet perfect, heaven's not here yet. So how do we do that? And how do we be a church that embodies that, embodies this culture, this new culture that Jesus came to set forth? So we're going we're gonna to kick that off next week. Really encourage you to be here for that. Uh, but today we're wrapping up our series, uh, What If There's More? Um, we've been uh, talking through January about what if there's more to the Christian life than, than we think? What if there's more to this thing called Christianity uh, than, we, than you know, we, we think? Because uh, oftentimes we put God in a box, we put our Christian faith in a box, we think we've arrived, we think that's all it has to offer, and I'm telling you there's so, so much more. Uh, and it can start today, uh, experiencing that. That's the good news. Many years ago, uh, I was driving with my family, we were out in West Minnesota, we were driving through the countryside and uh, came around this corner and there was this, this beautiful barn, red barn, up on this hillside. Uh, had a stone base around it. Just, I mean, something you would see in like a picture. Had uh, a valley next to it and in this valley there were, there were horses roaming around. And it was, the sun was shining, blue skies, beautiful house behind it. Had this like picket fence surrounding the property. And I remember just thinking to myself, man, <laughs> that's like, that's like a little glimpse of heaven. That's like, that's like heaven on earth. I even felt myself going, God, when I, when I get to heaven, could I have a little place like that? Maybe with a, like a Chipotle down the road, all right? Um, but, but could I have a place <laughs> like that? To me, that would be, that'd be heaven. And I have a feeling heaven's going to be so much greater than even that. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, you know, what God has prepared for those who, who, who love him. So we're, I think it'll be greater than that, but it did get me thinking about, about heaven and what that's going to be like. You know, the Bible doesn't give us a ton of details about what I think it's going to be so much greater than we probably even have categories for. Uh, but it does say things like this. We read this in Revelation 21.4. It says, uh, Jesus will wipe every tear from, from our eyes. There, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain where the old order of things uh, will have passed away. And so this is, this is the good news that we have in Christ, that when we die, and all of us will at some point die unless Jesus returns before that, we're going to go to this place, uh, this physical place called heaven. Jesus says, if it wasn't true, why, why would I tell you about this place? Why, why would I get your hopes up uh, if, it wasn't, if it wasn't the case that I'm, I've made a place for you? Um, and so this morning, what I want to talk about is what if there's more to sharing our faith? Uh, because oftentimes what happens is, you know, God tends to use real life struggles in our life to draw us closer to him. He just often works that way. And so when it comes to pointing people to Jesus, it's usually through some kind of crisis or trial or challenge, problem. Somebody's uh, going through, and uh, there's a lot that Jesus has to offer. Jesus does help us with things like our marriage. You know, sometimes we're helping someone whose marriage is falling apart. Well, Jesus has a lot to, to say about that and a lot that he can help us with. And sometimes it's a, a child or raising kids, and we don't know what to do, and Jesus has a lot to help us uh, in, in that area. It could be we just need help in, in his provision when it comes to, like, our finances or a job situation. And so we oftentimes find ourselves sharing our faith and pointing people to Jesus through these real-life problems and challenges where Jesus can come in and help us. But this morning, I want to remind us that it, sharing our faith with others about Jesus goes beyond that. Because heaven... And where people are going to go after they die is at stake. The Apostle Peter, knowing this, 
Uh, he brings this up in, in 1 Peter 3, and I, I want us to hear um, what, what Peter says in, in, in 1 Peter 3.15 um, on this topic of sharing our faith. He says, first, in your hearts, honor the Christ Lord as holy. The word holy here literally means set apart, okay? It means unique, special. Uh, we read the Bible, we read about all the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles and disciples, and as, as great as all of those people were and the amazing things they did, we need to be reminded uh, Jesus is higher than all of them. Jesus is the one true God who comes in the flesh to save us from our sin, to carry our sin upon himself. He is the only one, only God could do that. And Jesus is God in the flesh, so we regard him as special. We regard him as set apart above all other gods. He is holy, and that's what we do as Christians. That's what we do as a church. We worship him as holy, as set apart. Peter goes on to say, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, we need to understand that this idea of hope is always future, right? Um, to hope for something is to hope for something that's going to come in the future. If you have it right now, you don't need to hope for it because you already have it. So this, this, is, this is future. So what's he talking about? What is this hope that he's talking about? He's talking, of course, about heaven. That's the hope that we have, that once we die, we get to go and be with Jesus in this place called heaven. The Apostle Paul elsewhere talking about, you know, when brothers and sisters in, in Christ die, um, he says, yes, we're going to mourn, we're going to miss them, but not without hope. Meaning what? We're going to see them again. This is the hope that we have. We will see them again in heaven. And Peter says we need to be able to give a defense for this hope that we have. Um, now, I don't have time this morning to get all the ways we can give a defense for this, but I will tell us one practical way I think is, is, is maybe the most effective way to give a defense, which is simply to share your story. Who were you before you came to know Jesus? And what has God done in your life? Who are you now? How has Jesus helped you? How, has he given you more joy? Has he given you more peace that you didn't have before? Um, Share your story, whether it's one of those drastic stories or even if it's just in small ways. Sometimes that's actually more powerful in what people need to hear. Um, you maybe you don't think you have much of a testimony or a story to share, and I'm telling you, we all do if we're in Christ. God has done something in our life that can bless someone, someone else. You know, we're living in what's called the post-postmodern world, which is, is, is an environment where people determine their own truth and uh, everyone can come and make up their own church. There's really no standard or authority anymore, culturally speaking. Um, and so people are going to disagree with you when it comes to the doctrines you believe. People are going to disagree with you when it comes to the scriptures you believe. In fact, online, I often see Christians arguing with atheists trying to use the Bible. Like they don't believe <laughs> in the Bible. It's not effective. But here's what they can't disagree with. They can't disagree with your story. What has God done in your life? So it's a very powerful and effective way that we can share or give a defense of this hope that we have. Because the more I experience God in my life, you know, the more I become convinced he's real and he's alive and he's made a place for me to bring me to himself once I die. Now, do we go about this with anger? Do we, how, how are we supposed to go about this? Because a lot of Christians today, I do think, are angry and angsty. Okay? But look at what Peter says next. This is interesting. He says, yet do it with gentleness and what? Respect. Okay? Now, sometimes I think when we read the Bible, we get the sense that the, the apostles like Peter, and even Jesus sometimes were bold and, you know, just said it like it is, and, and, and they do that. We do see that in the Bible. You see that with Peter? But if you study the times they do that, you're going to find there's, there's always a context for that, which is they always are talking to the religious. When, when you see the apostles get like that, when you see Jesus get like that, he's dealing with people who should know better. But when they go outside of Jerusalem and they start going into Samaria and talking to the Samaritans or the Gentiles beyond that, their posture changes. 
Think about Jesus when he meets the woman at the well and the the love and the gentleness and respect he shows her, the humility he brings to that conversation where he asks her to bring him something to drink to lower her defenses. So she feels like she has something to offer in this relationship. That's Jesus. That's his strategy for her to open her heart to what he has to say. How about Paul when he goes to Mars Hill? I love that, that story where Paul's at, Paul's at Mars Hill and he finds these idols, these statues, and one of them's to an unknown God. He doesn't show up and say, chop it down. Chop down this evil idol. It, well, it is evil. But rather, he uses it to say, let me tell you who this unknown God is. And he uses it to point them to Yahweh, to Jesus. And the salvation we have in his name. He's, using, he's being respectful and gentle of the culture that these people know in the hopes to lead them to Christ. Uh, recently, we had our own controversy right here in Minneapolis. Uh, some of you heard the story made national news, the guy at the Mall of America who wore the T-shirt, um, where he was uh, asked to either take it off or to leave. They eventually let him stay, but the front of the T-shirt, like I had no problem with, the front of the T-shirt just said, Jesus saves. And I thought, well, amen, like that's great. Jesus does save. I thought that was actually a step up from like those Christian parody shirts. You know, instead of Sprite, it says Spirit. Instead of ketchup, it says catch up with Jesus, right? I thought that's a step up. I like that. I like that it says Jesus saves. But the back of the shirt, you know, the back of the shirt, some of us aren't aware. We saw things on social media and there's a lot of passion around this. But maybe you're not aware, like the back of the shirt, it had the word coexist on it. We've all seen that bumper sticker that people have, right? And, and it, it's got the crescent moon in there. It's got the Jewish star somewhere in, in there. The T is the cross. And it's got all the religious symbols. And it says coexist. Well, the, this dude, you know, my brother in Christ, his, back of his t-shirt, it had it just slashed out. I don't want to coexist with you, Right? And then it said, and then it said, you know, Jesus is the only way or something like that. And I agree with that. However, I would ask, is, is that really the most effective way for us to tell people about Jesus? Slashing out coexist. Like, if if a Muslim was at, you know, the Mall of America and he had the peace sign. Let's just take that for a second. The peace sign. You all know the peace sign, the traditional peace sign. If you don't, just find Pam Sawyer. Okay, those of you know Pam, right, used to work at our coffee shop. She probably has the earrings on this morning. She loves the peace sign. But just imagine if a Muslim was walking around with that slashed out and said, Muhammad is the one true prophet. Would you care at all what that person really has to say? You, you see, friends, we, we, people don't really care what you know until they know you what? So they know you care. And so I would argue, you know, we can <laughs> have different viewpoints on that, but I would at least argue it's not the most effective way. I was talking to someone as well this past week who um, at one point in his ministry was sitting down with a Muslim and they were studying the Bible and the Quran together and trying to just talk about their faith. And I said, would you ever wear that t-shirt to show up and at the coffee shop with that person? He said, of course not. And, and of course we wouldn't because we know it's unnecessarily offensive. The gospel's offensive because it tells us we need a savior, but sometimes, Christians, it's just us being jerks. And we don't need to be unnecessarily offensive. Peter here tells us we need to share our faith with gentleness and and respect. And so I, I, I really see these two motives warring in Christians' hearts, especially right now. On one hand, there's kind of this anger and this angst, and we just kind of want to stick it to the world because we see all the evil that's taking place out there, and I get it. I feel that warring in me. I have that rise up in me often. When I see the things that are being taught to kids in schools, hearing about kids mutilating their bodies, there's a part of me, there's a righteous anger that rises up in me, and I get, I get upset about that. However, it, going out there with anger is not the most effective uh, It's not the best way to share our faith. This morning, what I want to do is remind us that our ultimate motive shouldn't be trying to score points politically or whatever. it's It's to lead people to know Jesus so that they go to this place called heaven when they die. Because the Bible also talks about another place where people are going to go 
who don't know this Jesus. And this morning, with the rest of our time, I just want to spend some time reminding us about this terrible truth, this place called hell. Jesus, by the way, talks more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. He talks more about hell than he does heaven. He gives us more specific pictures of what hell's going to look like than he does heaven. This is a major warning Jesus gives us. He says things like this in Matthew 10. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He says, rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And he's talking about God here who can throw us in hell. And that's what our sin does. It separates us from God. And so just a few reminders of what hell is. We need to first remember that hell, what it is, is complete separation from God. And, and maybe some of us don't think that sounds all that bad because a lot of people here on earth live their life separated from God. But here's the difference. Here in this life, we get to experience something theologians call common grace. It's God's common grace. Uh, Jesus says it this way, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He and sends rain, which was good for growing crops, okay, on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, whether you're good, evil, righteous, unrighteous, we all get to experience this thing called common grace, God's good gifts to us here in this life. Things like food. Anybody like food? You know, this past week we had a, a staff lunch and some gals got together and they decided the theme was going to be a salad bar. I was a little nervous. So I actually brought a plate of salami. That was what I had to contribute. I had meatballs in my bag as a backup. But then I started going through and sampling. Friends, we have discovered how to make lettuce taste good. My pet rabbit would have been so proud of me. I was eating these salads and I was going, this is the, I just can't believe. I mean, this is God's common grace that we can even eat things like lettuce, and have figured out how to make it taste good to our taste buds. How about a shower? Anybody like a hot shower? If you have young kids, you look forward to that weekly shower, don't you? You know what I'm talking about. How about just nice weather? Now, we don't know what that's like in Minnesota right now, but we're getting a little taste of hell right now. But, it, but we know it's coming. That's the hope that we have. We know what's coming. And, and all of it, friends, and everything. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. Food, you know, sh showers, uh, weather, uh, th sex, right, within God's boundaries. I mean, all of it, everything. that God's, It's all common, grace, righteous, unrighteous. Get to experience. But here's what we need to remember. All of that goes away in this place called hell. In hell, we're, we're separated completely from God because every good thing comes from God. To be separated from God means we don't experience any of his common grace anymore. Jesus says this in Matthew 8. In that place, talking about hell, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, hell is complete separation from God where we don't experience his common grace anymore. And not only do we not experience his common grace anymore, second point I want us to remember is that hell is incredibly painful. It's described as a place of pain and suffering. In Revelation 21, 8, we read the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts and the idolaters and all the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Well, how many of us ever was kids maybe uh, or maybe as adults, but you touch the stove. <laughs> maybe your mom told you not to, but you touch the stove and you felt that heat. And friends, that was just your hand or a finger. I mean, the Bible is describing hell like that. Your whole body set ablaze. Now, I tend to think Jesus is being metaphorical. I'm not going to die on that hill. We can discuss that. But he also refers to it as darkness, so it seems like, you know, maybe a contradiction there. But regardless, it's a place of intense pain and suffering. And here's the really big problem. Hell is eternal. Meaning it's, it's, guys, it's forever. Um, you know, just imagine with me a road that goes down this aisle, goes out the lobby, goes through our parking lot, through Brooklyn Park, 
eventually goes into the sky, into space, keeps going, goes past Mars, goes past Jupiter, uh, goes past Pluto, uh, eventually out of our galaxy. Now we're going, you know, hundreds of millions of light years and just keeps going and going. Imagine that path. Your life here on earth is this. That's all it is. The the rest is your eternity. And friends, that's what ultimately matters, is where are you going to spend, right, that? Where are people going to spend that? Now, many theologians, because we hate this truth, myself included, have tried to change it and said the word eternal doesn't really mean forever. Uh, But the problem with that is if you start messing with the word eternal, then what does that mean for heaven? Uh, Do we not have eternal life? Forever with Jesus? Okay, and there's even a bigger problem with it. Jesus doesn't just use the word eternal to describe hell. Look what he says in Mark 9. He says this, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now, let me just stop there for a second. He's talking about the seriousness of sin. I don't want anyone coming next week looking like a pirate, okay? Um, He's using hyperbole here, and this is ultimately a matter of the heart. You're not going to fix this by gouging out your eye. But he's trying to get about how serious sin is. Why? He says it's better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. He's not using the word eternal here, but here he's saying the fire never goes out. And now he's using this idea of a worm that eats you from the inside out, meaning you never can get comfortable. You never can find any rest because there's this worm eating at you. Friends, hell is terrible. God doesn't want anybody to go there. And now do we understand why we as God's people have been given a mission? Can I get an amen? To tell people about Jesus? the one who takes our sin, the one who takes our hell upon himself and pays it in my place, that's the peace I have. My hell has already been paid through Christ. Anybody else? That's that's why I worship him. That's why I love him. He paid for my sin. He paid my hell for me already. It's done. And so, friends, this is is why the church has a mission. But where do we start with that? Well, I just want to give us one thing that we can do you know, where it starts, you can do this today, it, it really does need to start with prayer. Who do you need to pray for? That God would open up the eyes of their heart to see their need for Jesus. Because we're all told we're born in this world blind. We're born, born spiritually blind. We need to pray and ask God would open up people's heart to see their need for a Savior. It really does start with prayer. Um, the, the night I got saved, I was high as a kite, okay? Uh, I'm not going to tell you what drugs I was on, but I was uh, out of my mind. I actually blacked out. I had never done that before. And when I came to, um, I started seeing demons all around me. And, and I knew in that moment, in a way I've never known before, that if I were to die, I knew I was going to this place called hell. I felt it for the first time in my life. It wasn't just something I had heard about. I felt it. Like, if I die, I'm going to hell. And I started wigging out. I'm seeing these demons. I'm feeling that. In fact, uh, one person at this party I was at actually took me outside in this apartment complex, walked me to the pool. I think he was going to try to push me into the pool, either to sober me up, or maybe they just thought it would be funny or something like that. I, I got ready to fight this dude. Um, by the way, that guy would die three weeks later from a drug overdose, somebody I knew from my childhood. He ended up backing off. We went back to the apartment, but I couldn't shake it. I'm like, I'm going, I'm going to hell. If I die, I'm going to hell. And I was just feeling it. It was heavy. And that's the night I went, I said, I, I left the party. I went, I went back to my place and I got on my knees and I knew enough to say, Jesus, if you can save me, save me. That's all I knew really at the time. I didn't know much. it take... 10 years to figure out the rest and all the specifics of the gospel. But that night, just if you can save me, 
God, my life is in your hands. Save me from this hell that I know I deserve. The next day, I uh, called a friend. This was a childhood friend I hadn't seen for years. It's somebody who's been my best friend growing up. Hadn't seen him for years because I dropped out of high school. You know, my friends all knew I was going places, just not graduation, okay? It was, it was kind of more likely jail, all right? They, and this dude heard me on the phone, and he said, I can't believe it's you. I can't believe you're calling me right now. He said, just the other night, some of the guys you went to school with that you grew up with, we all got together, and we were sitting around, and your name came up. And all of a sudden, one of us said, we should pray for him. And we stopped what we were doing, and we prayed for you. And here you are calling me on the phone saying, this Sunday, you want to go to church with me. Friends, it didn't just change my life. It changed their life. Some of you have met Adam Paul. He's preached here in the past. He is a pastor. Now, he would tell you it's because of what happened that week. The power of God when we pray for people to open up their hearts. So I just ask you, who? Who is God putting on your heart? Friend? Somebody you go to school with? Somebody you work with? Could be a child. Could be a spouse. A neighbor. Who do you need to pray for? God would open up the eyes of their heart and show them his grace. And I also got to ask, what about you? If you were to die today, do you know where you would spend your eternity? Friends, that's why the step I talk about, this step right now, is why it's so important because it's going to determine where you spend that. We're going to one of two places, either heaven to be with Jesus or this terrible place called hell. Do you know where you're going to? The good news is you can know today. Ephesians 2 says it this way. Paul says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God. Not by works. We don't have to earn it. We can't earn it. So that no one can boast before God. What we do is we receive what Jesus has done for us. And I wonder if anyone needs to receive that grace, receive what Christ has done for them, letting him die on the cross and pay their hell for them this morning. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to ask, can we just bow our heads for a moment? If that's you, I need to know where I'm going to go. I want to receive this salvation that Christ provides for me today. Would, would you just take a step of faith and let me know so I can be in prayer for you? Would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand if that's you. Yeah, I see you. Just raise your hand. Let me know. I see you back there. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, I see you. I see you. The good news is today, Jesus has done it all. <laughs> It's already done, so let's receive it. Have a posture. God, I want to receive what you've done for me this this morning. And do you just pray this in your heart? This is between you and God, but you just say, God, I receive your salvation this morning through Jesus Christ. I confess that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And so I let Jesus take it upon himself. I let him pay my punishment in my place so that I can be forgiven and I can be set free from that terrible place. And now, Lord, come into my life. I want to know you. I want to experience you and have assurance knowing that I'm going to be with you once I leave this earth. So we have a posture of receiving that, all of us this morning, and we say thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. Give us that assurance this day we ask in your name and all God's people said. Well, friends, I saw three hands go up. Can we just applaud those three who received? And now this is in the service where we want to respond, right? Say, thank you, God, for your grace. So let's stand up. Let's worship together.